morning, Ms. Sibison. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, I'm Wendy Sibison. I represent Joanne Slitch Broder, convicted of the first degree murder in the killing of her husband. The jury's conclusion that my client was sane beyond a reasonable doubt is the unconstitutional product of compelled self incrimination. In 2006, this Court addressed a case uh, called Commonwealth versus Durham that concerned uh, the reciprocal discovery under Rule 14. And the dissenting justices in this case uh, were, were pretty sharp in their criticism of that decision uh, that, that the, the, this new rule was going to um, impact very severely a defendant's right to cross-examination. Uh, this case is a similar problem where the reciprocal discovery allowed the prosecution to invade the defense camp and uh, <laughs> Do you want to pick up uh, and, and violate my, cons my client's constitutional rights uh, to not com produce evidence against herself. Okay, I have a couple of questions on that issue. Um, the Commonwealth at one point moved to compel the defendant to produce a synopsis. Hold, hold on one second. Do you, do you, you need wanna, your papers? Do you want to get yourself organized again? No, thank you. Are you sure? I'm fine. Okay. I didn't need it anyhow. She knows it all. <laughs> the Commonwealth moved to compel the defendant to produce a synopsis of Dr. Brown's conclusions. Had he, had Dr. Brown reduced his um, conclusions to a synopsis? At the time that this discovery yes. order was entered, no, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. In fact, the, the, right. the defense had absolutely nothing. I think they had a, a name. I think okay. they knew Dr. Kelly okay. was now, going to be the, the exa expert. I, I just have a question. Um, the defense puts in the lack of, of criminal responsibility, makes that claim. Yes. If the defendant then puts her mental uh, condition into play as a reason for the lack of criminal responsibility, has she waived um, any? Uh, has she waived any rights or privileges that she has? I actually do need one of the cases that I just dropped okay. on the floor. Well, please uh, pick it Commonwealth up. Commonwealth versus Callahan for the first time, and okay. this court repeatedly held over and over again that the waiver in Blaisdell is a limited waiver. Blaisdell applies to a court-ordered examination. This wasn't a court-ordered examination, was it? Was this a court-ordered examination? But yes, for Dr. Kelly. Oh, this yes. was court ordered, so this oh, was yes, exactly the same under Section 15. Everything sort of started okay. off the way Rule 14 contemplates. Okay. We, did, we, we filed a piece of paper saying we're going to interpose this defense, and, and our expert may rely in part on testimonial statements. Right. That's, that's just how it got started. Okay. And then there was an order that the Commonwealth would pick their expert, and they did that. But then what followed was the Commonwealth sought this extraordinary discovery, and after a number of battles, the single justice cut it back a little bit, saying turn, turn all this, in, actually literally about a ream of information, including masses of testimonial statements my client made to our expert, to the prosecution expert. So that's what happened next. That was three well, weeks did, before did, trial. Okay, and at that time, did the Commonwealth have the right, in your view, to any discovery of, about Dr. Brown? I mean, they got a lot, but did they uh, have the right they, at that point? I think point under the anything? rule, maybe at that point, they have the right to his um, CV. Uh, and there's a couple of other things, you know, his name and address. And uh, there's, there's some basic just identification stuff that, what, what, that it had, did have. Yes, Your Honor. Um, put aside the ream of stuff. Both the pretrial conference report, I think, referenced reports in this context, right? And doesn't, that is, of, of on the issue of criminal responsibility, that there would be an exchange? Um, how that actually, I, th there was a pretrial conference report. I don't think, um, I think maybe there was some misunderstanding or else, I, I can't say what happened since I wasn't there, but this was not a report that was provided. Uh, Dr. Brown did provide a report eventually. There was no problem with providing the report. Um, but it wasn't a report that was, the, the battle wasn't over his providing a report. The battle was over providing all the underlying testimonial statements that went into forming his opinion. But I, I got the impression, and this is, correct me, because I, I yes. think you, you will. I mean, I got the impression that, what, that part of the reason of the Commonwealth in seeking what it sought um, was that it was getting, <laughs> it, it had gotten and was getting absolutely nothing from Dr. Brown as to what his, uh, diagnosis was. Uh, they're not entitled to that. 
uh, until, um, now let, let me think this through. Discovery of this sort of defense <coughs> under Wardius proceeds as follows. The Commonwealth, the, the, the defense gives its notice of a defense, provides the name and address and identifying data of who their expert's going to be. Then the Commonwealth's discovery has to provide all their discovery. And then the defense provides its discovery, which would include a report. That's how Wardius says it's supposed to proceed. I have to. I have to say, I don't when think you say it includes a report. Yes. What does the report include? The report is, needs to simply in, doesn't need to include any testimonial statements. In fact, it's it's not to include any testimonial statements. Diagnosis uh, and a basis for opinion. But they, you can say basis of my opinion were certain testimonial statements, and I don't think there's really a problem. I guess there isn't a problem if at, at best if the defense is going to name certain testimonial statements, identify certain testimonial statements during the expert's testimony. I relied on these testimonial statements. Perhaps pretrial discovery should include that too, but not until after, not until after the Commonwealth's discovery of everything, that, of the, the uh, results of their expert's report. I believe that's the order it's supposed to go in. I don't want to over, overemphasize, I don't want to, the order in this case, because the real Wardius violation here is not the order in which things proceeded, but the grotesquely imbalanced evidence that was produced through reciprocal discovery. But Getting back that, to the ream. But isn't that, a, the imbalanced evidence that's produced, isn't that best dealt with by a motion to, to um, compel further responses, oh. or a motion to strike the expert, or a motion to strike his testimony on certain subjects. Well, that's what they did. Um, yeah. There was a motion to compel. In the first place, the report right. he provided, the judge himself found, of the report Dr. Kelly provided, so this doesn't even say what diagnoses you did make of this person. All you that say is after, she's not. That was after the whole. That was, well, that was after all our discovery. That came like the fifth day of trial is when we first got something from him. The judge said, this isn't enough. So he provided another. but. Um, uh oh, I'm forgetting what the question was. Um, Let me ask another one. Then. Oh dear. The, um, it was a good no, question. No, 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 it was. Uh, it was. It was your statement that you know. The, the, oh, what Wardius. was included? What was included in the report? Yes. Um, in in. Oh, I know. You asked what about a motion to compel? Well, we certainly did move to compel, and and we moved to that he should provide all of his notes. And the judge said, that's, a, that's fair. What did he provide? I've given it to your honors. It is um, a document included in the motion to expand the record. And this is what it looks like. This is the first page. And that's the second page. That was our motion to compel. That's what we got. He didn't take any notes on my client's account of the critical events. He took not one note, and I've given your honors his own, our, our own division of forensic mental health that says there should be an extensive notes taken by all examining psychiatrists of the, um, the defendant's account of the events. You have these regs, I gave them to you. So that's what we got, and that's what they got. And that's why I'm not emphasizing the order, although the order is there for a good reason. What, it's it's the, the upshot. We got nothing, they got everything, but what they got was unconstitutional. They are not allowed to get. Do you consider that your state, your client's statements to the doctor were a confession of the crime? Your honors have all of the notes that were turned over. They are sealed. The prosecutor has not seen them. She was told about them verbally by, by, by Dr. Kelly. Um, but, uh, well, they're up. The answer is yes. Okay. So the answer you, is yes. So your, your view yeah, is yes, the as best as they are certainly, to the extent she was able to remember anything, they are close. So the substance of your view, as I understand it, maybe I'm wrong, is that the Commonwealth was never entitled to this stuff, That's never right. entitled to know what she told Dr. Brown outside of what Dr. Brown may have referenced in his report yes. or presumably may testify to. At best, at, at most, what she, he was going to testify to. Correct. But, so never really, even after Dr. Brown testified, the Commonwealth would not be entitled to find out what Correct. the defendant told Dr. Brown. Absolutely not. Right. But I assume when Dr. Brown's testifying, of course, the Commonwealth can ask him extensively 
what the defendant told him and whether or not that was ba – whether his opinion was based on – what she told him. Right? I don't think that's correct, Your Honor. You can't, you can't cross-examine the basis of you the expert opinion? You find out, discover during testimony. What else yeah. did she tell you? Yes. Tell me the whole story that she told you? I don't think so. No. But, what, but, but Here, you, have put, you have put the mental condition of your client <clears throat> at issue. The doctor is testifying based on his – well, in this case, there was other things. I mean, there was also uh, some psychological examination – I mean, uh, testing. But – conversations I don't see why what the doctor what she told the doctor isn't fair, uh, fair game for cross-examination at trial the way this process was set up through who, I mean, yes okay but maybe maybe I mean I'm not saying but maybe it was set up in a in a, in a nonsensical way because oh. how is the Commonwealth supposed to rebut a I'll tell An you how. expert testimony, it can't hear it for the first time at trial and then call its expert that, that immediately thereafter in rebuttal. The reason, there are two, I think, two main reasons to talk about the way, why Blaisdell was, was decided the way it was. In the first place, someone needs to be able to prepare a defense and talk to their expert and prepare for trial without waiving their rights to the, all of their rights. And one of the reasons why, I think I want to get to the, the, the way you're questioning me, that if you tell the Commonwealth every single thing that the defendant told her own expert, why not her own lawyer? Oh, no. no that's what, well, different. her own expert. Then what it does, if they're able to use all that information, this court has said, no, not it, use it against her. Not use it against her in substance, but it use allows, it against it, her on the claim of lack of criminal responsibility. If it is a complete, it, it is this this waiver. That this, I'm only saying what this court has said so far is not to be held as a complete relinquishment of her privileges, because that would allow pressure on the defendant to take the witness stand herself. So you think that through. I mean, I've, I've read that many times, and I've thought about it. What it means is, the defendant gets to choose. And, and I, I still don't know quite the answer to Justice Cordy's question. Maybe the answer is you can ask and say, well, did she tell you? What else did she tell you? Maybe. But if that's allowed, what happens is the defendant chooses to have an expert testify. She doesn't choose to testify in her own defense. She chooses to have an expert testify. And he bases his opinion on certain things that she tells him. And the rest he doesn't base his opinion on. He, bases, he, he chooses. In fact, she could choose, in this case, if she had known that every single thing she was going to tell her expert was going to be disclosed to the Commonwealth, she may have chosen not to use an expert at all, or at least to use an expert who only looked at her medical records, who looked at the police reports, and didn't interview her at all. Well, isn't that, that a kind of strategic decision that counsel makes in consultation with the doctor? Oh. Do, you need, do you need to interview her and get her version in order to form an opinion? Well, yes, but the other critical part of that strategic decision is, is Blaisdell in Rule 14. Mm -hmm understanding what, what's waived and what isn't. But and until why, this why trial... Isn't the, why isn't the Fifth Amendment privilege waived in, in this kind of situation? Because this court has repeatedly said the Commonwealth's opportunity to rebut the defendant's evidence is, is in enforcing the defendant to submit to an extensive interview by someone in the defense camp. Which this court said Someone in the in defense the camp, you mean, you mean in the by, prosecution by a, camp? By a, no, no, in the defense camp. No. I'm sorry. No, in the prosecution camp. Right. That's I right misspoke. Mean, Thank yeah. you. Um, that say, is, that that is the, the it, balancing. It's by an independent examiner. Independent examiner. Well, yes, yes. except for that's not really well, what no, happened. But, but the point is the Commonwealth gets to have the same the, the, the person examined by oh, oh, somebody yes. else. Yeah, yeah. It's the yes. opportunity to, to examine develop the defend, this, yes. To examine the defendant. Yes, it's the opportunity yeah, to yeah, develop yeah. the self-same evidence, the opportunity to elicit the self-same statements. And if the defendant doesn't submit, doesn't cooperate, there are sanctions. So that's, the, that's their opportunity. Okay, but, but, if, but, if, the, but how can the Commonwealth be expected to rebut what the defense expert says without knowing ahead of time? I mean, all expert testimony, you can't deal with it on the spot in the middle of a trial. Well, this is not a, an ordinary expert. This is an expert who's talking about criminal responsibility. But she put into play her criminal responsibility. Well, if this court is prepared to rethink Blaisdell after my client's trial, 
it still isn't right to apply it to my client. Because as I just said to Justice Cordy, it's not the only strategic decision when you talk to the defense expert, what do you need? It's what are we going to have to give them? If she says, I was perfectly sane, I just had a couple drinks and I wanted to kill him, do we have to give that to the Commonwealth? She didn't say that. But if she did, uh, you need to look at what the rules are. Okay, and Blaisdell said this is a limited waiver very limited waiver. In fact, it's so limited that it doesn't even, this court said in Callahan, it has said many other times, it doesn't even waive the statutory privilege. The, the um, prosecution's witness is still not allowed. Still, even if he knows about all kinds of admissions and confessions, he is still not allowed to testify under it because Blaisdell preserved the statutory privilege. So this is a limited waiver. This is how this court thought it through. If it's going to change it, which I think would be terrible because it, inv it involves the same kind of invasion of the defense camp as, as the Durham case did in re requiring turning over um, um, uh, cross-examination material of Commonwealth witnesses. This is the flip side of it, where suddenly the, the Commonwealth is entitled to a panoply of statements that we don't intend to put in evidence. Confessions, admissions, all kinds of damaging stuff. And by the way, that was used in this case. Okay, but isn't there a difference between the defense contemplating the possibility of an insanity defense, giving notice of it, preserving its rights not to pursue it, and in that case, the Commonwealth has the opportunity to question the defendant in order to prepare a, for, for a, a rebuttal, but that information is not made available to the prosecution until the defense goes beyond contemplating an insanity defense to actually presenting it. And you presented an insanity defense here, so doesn't that put us in a different posture when you go ahead and put the defendant's mental state in issue by claiming insanity? If I understood your question, Your Honor, actually the Commonwealth has the immediate opportunity to develop the exact same evidence. Right, I as understand. As soon as we give notice. But, the, but, the, but if, if you had given notice, Dr. Kelly interviews your client, according to Judge Spina's order, he couldn't give the admissions that were made to him to the prosecutor. That's true. Okay, so prosecution can't use whatever was said to Dr. Kelly until you go to trial and say, I plan to not merely contemplate insanity defense, I plan to present it, correct? And then once, he, once you plan to present it, then that frees Dr. Kelly to testify to what your client told him, correct? Uh, that's not my understanding of the law, no. Oh, so you say so that Dr. Kenley, when he testifies, can't make reference? He can say, reference? I spoke, I, I interviewed, the def I interviewed no. her. He, he is not, as my understanding is, he is not allowed to testify to admissions and confessions that she made to him. And He's allowed to base his opinion on them, but not to testify to even them. On Justice because this wait, court has even said, on Justice Gantz's theory, though, yes. on, on his hypothesis, how can the Commonwealth question its expert if, it, if the Commonwealth doesn't know what he's going to say? You can't put the, the expert up there and well, start asking questions and not knowing what the answers are going to be. The, common, the Commonwealth does, well, in the first place, the Commonwealth isn't entitled to extensive, def, I mean, they know what he's going to say. They're getting his report. But and, I think it, and, I, if, I, and if they want to know what specific testimonial statements he's going to rely on, for example, in this case, he relied on, on these tests. Um, I suppose uh, he's allowed to give the results of the tests. But, but the testimonial statements that they were based on, no. Not unless he's going to put them in evidence. But, but, but who? That's who? our who? choice he, of what he, we who? get to put in evidence. He who put them in evidence. Yeah. He who? Uh, I, I beg your pardon. The basis of Dr. Brown's, of, of the defense expert's opinion. If he bases his opinion on specific testimonial but, statements. But then when will the Commonwealth know that? I mean, you can't, we can't have a trial by ambush for either side. We, that Ms. isn't our uh, rules. It, maybe in theory you can't have a trial by ambush, but in this case, we were the ones who were ambushed. We had no idea what Dr. Kelly based his opinion on. We had no notes. We had no testimonial statements. Okay, but, I, that, but, but that's a different argument. I mean, well, they're no. claiming that you were denied adequate disclosure of Dr. Um, Kelly's statements. You're basically, I mean, the problem that I, I'm having, at least, is uh, under your theory of how it should play out, Dr. Brown can take four isolated statements of the defendant, rely upon those four isolated statements, give his opinion, 
when it turns out that there are many other statements which actually would contradict his opinion, but the prosecution will never learn of those other statements. They'll only learn of the statements which support his opinion. It's almost uh, I mean, this that's, approach. That's what you say should happen, right? Well, I, I guess I almost think that uh, th there's not much difference between what this court is suggesting than just simply requiring that once she's waived the privilege, why can't the Commonwealth call her to testify? And that's one of the things this court talked about in Blaisdell. If you talk about a complete waiver in the way this court is talking about to, in, in theory, so-called balance the, the, the fairness of discovery, that kind of waiver would, would allow her to be compelled to testify What's the difference? Could I ask you something, stepping back Yes, a and I'm in a horror that the red light is blinking. Okay. Let, Complete well, horror. I'm going to extend it because I get to ask a question, maybe. Um, here's my question, and, and it's, it's, you need to educate me. If Dr. Brown testifies, uh, you know, I think she suffers from a mental disease. All he testifies, and it's based on she told me X, Y, and Z. You say that. So, so he is relying on, he has testified to statements that she made. Yes. You say that Dr. Kelly, when he then testifies thereafter, cannot say any statements that the defendant made to him? I don't know. I, it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's how I, you, that's how you the understand way I, our it's, law? It's the way I have read the case law that may not be so. Okay. Well, ordinarily, uh, I think the rule is that you put an expert on yes. in direct examination. You yes. can't, other than sort of uh, questions about what kinds of resources and things did he consult to form his opinion, yes. generally you can't then go in on direct and outline the basis of the opinion. In right. other words, to say, tell us well, all of right. the hearsay things or all of the things that you learned. That's really a subject for cross-examination. Right, generally. but in this case, statements of the defendant wouldn't be exactly hearsay. <clears throat> no, they no. wouldn't be hearsay. I guess that's right. <laughs> okay. um, I have a question on another subject. But I they're not admitted just... substantively either. No, but the, oh, that's, no, but, no, no, they're but not they, admitted yeah. substantively, but they're the basis of his opinion. Right, right. but Ms. on direct examination, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ms. Siversen, you've obviously read Blaisdell. You may not be as familiar with Justice Quillico's dissent in which Justice Block had joined. Um, yeah. Now, the dissent doesn't always accurately characterize what the majority of the court is holding, uh, but at least the, the, the dissent is highlighting what it sees as a problem. I'm not asking you to do it now, but I would appreciate it if you would take, and I would ask Ms. Montoli to do the same thing, to take a look at the dissent and, and read your respective interpretations, taking that lens into account, because it's a, I mean, obviously the court was struggling with precisely the issue that you presented here. We're going to order that you submit to a psychiatric examination during the course of which you're going to make, there's a potential that you would make inculpatory statements, yes. if not confessions, and then what are we going to do about those? And I think you are raising that, albeit it came up in a discovery context, and the question is, uh, they didn't, when they wrote Blaisdell, they didn't have this kind of discovery. And maybe the answer is, you don't get it in discovery. You might be able to get it at trial, notwithstanding Justice Cowan's concerns, because it's just different uh, when you're doing it at trial. But it would be helpful if you could look at those. Would you like a post-argument letter sure. on that, Your Honor? Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say that this, this court can only go so far because there is a statute no, on no, how I, far, this, this right. takes how far the, the prosecution expert may go. Yeah, 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 no, no, it takes this into Two, account. 233... Is that 20, is that the? 20, 233, 23B. Other. And that's uh, what Justice Quillico is talking about, same statute. Yes. Same statute. Yes. I mean, it's all there. So you can really, so at least for me, as I was looking at this, I just found it very interesting, and I, I didn't want to say you, you should know the dissent, you don't need to, but it would be helpful, because it is a very, uh, you know, so close to the Fifth Amendment privileges, uh, and which both, you know, the Commonwealth and you uh, recognize. I, just I have a question on a totally other subject. But, Thank you. Um, that's the subject of the um, fact that the trial judge allowed the defendant's attorney to testify about her observations of the defendant. Now, I assume this wasn't the defendant's attorney allowed, who was I'm, representing I think, wait, her. Wait, I'm trial. sorry, I missed that. Okay. The judge permitted, as I understand it, the defendant's attorney, the defense attorney, yes, a defense attorney, to testify oh. about her observations of the defendant. 
and what had occurred with this when this attorney was representing this defendant in court two days after the crime. Yes. I assume that was not the attorney who represented the defendant at trial. Oh, no. This was actually okay. her divorce attorney. Right, well, she was arrested, and she just needed right, somebody to go to court clear with. clear to me in the whole That's thing. correct. That's so strange. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Yes. Um, I, I want to say one thing which is not in my brief. Um, because I had a crisis of conscience. On my request for 233E reduction, uh, 33E reduction, um, I re asked for second degree murder. That was because I was reaching for what I thought might be realistic, but I realized it's not my job to be realistic. It's my job to ask for what I think is actually a just outcome, and I think that would be manslaughter for all the reasons that this court already has. Thank you, Ms. Thank Citizen. you, and I would also ask this court to really look at the Lanigan issue. This is absolutely critical in these cases. If psychiatry is treated as soft versus junk science, we're going to have a lot of junk science convicting defendants. And I would suggest that the respected person in this case who has been respected many times in the past, his opinion is no longer <laughs> passes the Lanigan test. Thank you, Ms. Susan. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Montori. Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Jane Montori, uh, an assistant district attorney in Hamden County, appearing on behalf of the Commonwealth in this matter. Uh, this was an attempt at trial by ambush, and the procedure in this case bears that out. What the Commonwealth wanted in this case was the Dr. Brown's diagnosis of this defendant. And where, where, where do you get your authority to get that before, where do you get your authority to get that? It, because it's, you, because 14, you, you talk about 14, I think, A6, but it seemed to me that A, is that the one I mean? Yes. Yes. Um, it seems to me that A6 basically cuts criminal responsibility out of this general rule. Well, the Commonwealth reads that as saying it cuts out the Commonwealth's expert or the independent examiner. Blaisdell did not address discovery. That's for sure. Um, we didn't have discovery, and we might have been a lot better off. Um, that's just my own view. And it's not the Commonwealth's position that in pretrial discovery, the Commonwealth should get the defendant's in testimonial statements that she made to her expert. You, you agree you shouldn't? We should not. But you got him trial. Here. But you did get We here. did not, actually. Okay. You should not get what before the trial? Testimonial the, de testimonial. the defendant's testimonial statements to her expert. Justice Spina ordered that the what Justice Judge Josephson had allowed the um, Commonwealth's motion for discovery. Um, and I believe it's at, in the defendant's record appendix around page 85. Just to back up one step. And Justice Spina forbid Dr. Kelly from giving over the defendant's statements, statements. until further order of the Superior Court, right. even though the Superior Court had already ordered that. Well, well it wasn't it's clear, not but, clear. Yeah. She ordered his curriculum vitae, either a report or correspondence, and test results. Paragraph four, which she denied, said words to the effect of, to the effect, to the extent the defendant's statements are not in the above materials, we re request them, and she denied that. The material that was submitted to Dr. Kelly came from defense counsel. But what, and what, okay. what gives Dr. Kelly at that stage the right to all that information? Just reciprocal discovery. Um, either the discretion or automatic. What happens if you take, if, if, if let's assume that, I assume that Ms. Sibison <coughs> is correct, and so you've got a psychiatrist like Dr. Kelly in this case, says I'm not going to take any notes, violates all kinds of, you know, codes of professional, you know, regulations, and says I just don't have anything. 
But uh, Dr. Kelly wrote a report. In fact, he wrote two reports. And what about all the underlying was, stuff? That were submitted to the court. And so any of the underlying material? Well, we, he took two pages of notes. To, well, I mean, isn't this a nice and way the, for, the, isn't this a nice way to. believe me, cross-examined him extensively on that and yeah, used but this it is, in her but closing. But I mean, here's my concern. If we, if we push discovery in this direction, what's going to happen is we really will get junk science because you're going to have lawyers saying to psychiatrists, whatever you do, don't take any notes. Don't take any notes. These are busy people. I mean, they, they actually see a lot of people, including a lot of patients. Sometimes they see eight a day with very complex histories. They can say, don't take any notes because you're going to have to turn them over. I mean, Dr. Kelly is experienced, uh, and he's certainly experienced in the criminal justice system, and looks pretty tactical to me. And that's what we're going to end up with, which is craziness. Well, I think if you look at the federal rule, which says that if the defendant raises a defense of lack of criminal responsibility or um, insanity, that what the government gets is the expert's CV, his opinion, and the basis of his opinion. And if the Commonwealth had received that in this case, well, and, and what, what none of this would have occurred. Okay. Put, put the... 2004 amendments of Rule 14 to one side for a second. So, so pre-September 7th, 2004, or whatever day it was, um, what did Blaisdell say you could get and when? Blaisdell didn't address what the does it Does it address report, though? No, not no. of the defense expert. It only, in my reading, addresses the report of the independent examiner. Because what Blaisdell is concerned of is the use at trial of the report and the basis of the report. Well, I but think it's Blaisdell concerned was, Wasn't Blaisdell about a competency exam? No, Blaisdell, I believe, was a criminal responsibility right, okay. case. There's a later case on where um, the court has held that the Blaisdell procedure applies to competency. Right, okay. The Blaisdell doesn't help us on the discovery. So no, it does not. If we can take a step back then. Let me, <laughs> let me try to understand this. As a result of the various procedural orders and discovery processes, the Commonwealth got a whole bunch of material from Dr. Brown. Did the well, Commonwealth get it, or no, was it turned over to Dr. It Kelly? It was turned over to Dr. Kelly, and Justice Spina erected a sort of firewall and said, you cannot discuss the defendant's statements with the prosecution until your an order until by order of the superior court and that's what happened here and that order came before dr brown testified yes it came i will say that the commonwealth after all of this was turned over to dr kelly there was still no report by dr brown explaining what his diagnosis was. And in this case, there was not just a diagnosis of one mental uh, disease or defect. There were as a diagnosis of four, and one of those had two subparts. And the prosecutor in this case, who has experience in these sorts of cases, said he was not familiar with two of those diagnoses. Right. So and, I that think and that report was given to the Commonwealth before Dr. Brown testified, but during the trial? It was the first time the Commonwealth learned his diagnosis was on the second day of jury impanelment. Now, with respect to all of the material that was turned over to Dr. Kelly, you say that was discoverable as reciprocal discovery or other discretionary discovery? Yes, because the the rule does reciprocal discovery in the commonwealth's view doesn't mean that the defendant has to get it first and then the commonwealth gets it in this context i say usually it does it usually does but in this context because criminal responsibility is really under the control of the defendant and although the independent examiner has an opportunity to examine the defendant um, the defendant is given lamb warnings. Um, she does have a privilege against self-incrimination. So, and, and I think it's clear from Dr. Kelly's uh, February 9th report, which is in the appendix of sealed documents, that the defendant was not very forthcoming in this case with him. I mean, she certainly 
it didn't rise to the level of deprivation of an interview, but it doesn't appear that she gave him the same thing she gave her expert. And I think that's one of the um, principles of Blaisdell. There's a sort of an assumption that, well, the independent examiner is going to get the same thing as the I, defense expert. I'm not expert. sure that you're correct about that. And in this case... I'm, I'm really not sure that you're correct about that. Well, I think that, but that... When you say the same thing, what do you mean the same thing? Well, the thing? same, I mean, they're given access, but the same sorts of information, so that it equals the, play, it um, evens out the playing field. But I think no, this I case think, shows think, that that's not what I, happens. I, don't, I mean, I, th I think a fair reading of Blaisdell is you've got two experts. Different experts will ask different questions. The expert may decide that, tell me precisely what happened that morning, right? Another expert may not care about what happened that morning. Um, if the expert, the, co the Commonwealth expert, the independent expert, asks questions, tell me precisely where were you, what were you thinking, da da da, and she says, I cancel member, I cancel member, I cancel member, then the expert can testify at trial. Um, I thought it was a fabrication. I thought it was malingering. I thought it was da 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 da. You know, she obviously had enough um, mental capacity to. I mean, that's that's what plays out. It, it's not saying what she tells this expert is going to be compared to what she tells another expert, and that the jury are then somehow going to say, well, she was lying in one and lying in the other. But I think that's the assumption, of, at least part of the <coughs> assumption upon which Blaisdell is based. No, part of the assumption on which Blaisdell is, is, is based is each expert can, if they are an expert, can ascertain what information the expert needs and what information it doesn't get and draw a conclusion from that. It doesn't go and look and see what information is given to a different psychiatrist and to say, well, I think based on what you gave to psychiatrist A and what you're giving me, I'm making a conclusion. That, it seems to me, is not what Blaisdell is all about. I mean, there is an assumption running through Blaisdell that there's a little difference between talking to your own expert initially and talking to an independent expert. I'm not, I don't, Agree and the reason that. is because there's no reciprocal discovery in Blaisdell. The thrust of Blaisdell is to a defendant, if you want to raise this defense, you are going to have to submit yourself to an independent examination. That's the focus, and what happens in that examination may lead you to make inculpatory statements, if not a confession. It, ha it had nothing to do with what was going on with the other expert. Right. There could be nine other experts that the defendant had talked to. But I think maybe well, I didn't make myself clear. I think Blaisdell talked about evening the playing field well, by giving the, the Commonwealth access. But it's access to access. the defendant, no, not to what the defendant says to another psychiatrist or to anybody else. It's not quite evening. I don't <coughs> think you can even say it's evening the playing field in the sense that Defendant picks an expert and has total access to him or her. That triggers the right to have the um, defendant examined by an independent expert that the Commonwealth does not have total access to. <coughs> so it's not, so in, in a way, you know, I think there's, a, there's a, definitely an argument that giving well, I, I think it is premised on the idea that, that there's going to be an independent expert not connected necessarily with the, not connected with the Commonwealth who's going to come to his or her own judgment based on whatever, whatever based the on are. that expert's yes. access. The right. issue is, can we force this defendant to talk to an independent that's the issue. Can that's we force issue. this defendant to talk to an independent expert without counsel present? Right? Because an independent expert is going to ask a whole bunch of questions which may well be inculpatory. We just had a case before, you know, somebody was trying to help himself and he doesn't realize that what he was doing was confessing to felony murder. I mean, that was exactly what the Commonwealth said. And I think it's a pretty accurate one. So what the court was trying to do is to say, you, you're going to raise criminal responsibility? What's, what's the Commonwealth supposed to do? They, don't even, they, don't, they have no way of doing it. We'll tell you what we'll do. 
will make you talk to an independent expert. That's all you get. That's all you get. I mean, you may ask for school records or something. I, I don't know about that. But essentially, the, the core of Blaisdell is we, the state, will force you, a citizen of the state who has a powerful Fifth Amendment right and Article 12 right not to testify. We will force you to testify if you want to raise this defense. Well, we will force you to be examined. Uh, to be examined. I mean, to talk. Yeah. And that's a very unusual thing because generally speaking, you can raise whatever defense you want to raise. You want to raise self-defense, we don't send you off to a psychiatrist and say, go, you know, go tell an independent person about what happened in the self-defense. It's very unusual. And none of it had anything to do with discovery. Uh, with respect to unusual, is this an unusual case? Is it in, yes, your, it in your county, yes, it is, is it ordinarily the case that defense experts required to give all this information to the Commonwealth's expert? Many times they do it voluntarily. There may be redaction of statements, but in many cases it's done um, perhaps so that the Commonwealth will agree that the defendant was not criminally okay. responsible well, at one the time, strategic reason and then it, yeah. the, nothing goes forward. Um, in, in the trial court, or um, but that suppose there's some a, sort of a plea. But, but this but is suppose unusual. suppose it's going to be a contested case. Criminal yeah. responsibility <laughs> will be contested at trial. It's then still what turned over in my experience. So the, it's Honor. unusual. It's, this is it very unusual. Turn, oh, and that has been my experience as well. But so this, what's, what's, me, what's, this, what's, what's the unusual, it? What's unusual? What's the, the fact that the, the Commonwealth did not get the expert's opinion and the basis of his opinion, in other words, the diagnosis. But you, no, wait, wait, wait. I, that, you're missing I, my point. I, the, the Commonwealth, there was a whole bunch of materials. I don't know what was in it, but I don't a know folio what was in of it materials that Dr. Brown had, including all, presumably all of the statements the defendant had made to Dr. Brown. The Commonwealth was ordered to turn them over to Dr. Kelly. No, no, no. no she, Dr. She, Brown I mean, excuse me, the, was ordered to, to turn, turn them, them over, over to, Dr. to Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly. Is that unusual? I've yes. never seen yes. that before. Yes. yes, it's very, it's very unusual. unusual. That's, yes. what I, that's the point I was trying yes. to get. Yes, and, and, so the, I'm sorry. Sorry. and so Dr. Kelly has this material. That's unusual. And then the court orders or orders that Dr. Kelly can turn all of this information over to the Commonwealth. Only upon at trial. Well, he can only. Th there was this protection for defendant statements and he could only turn over the statements um, upon order of the Superior right. Court judge. And, and that the court only did happened, order that at trial. He, that only happened after the defendant opened opening the statement, statement where she made it clear that her ex expert okay. would rely upon her statements. So the prosecutor had, in, for cross-examining cross -examining Dr. Brown, the prosecutor had all of the statements the defendant had made to Dr. Brown. By that time, I believe he had some, the, the ones that he would have gleaned from Dr. Kelly after the Superior Court ordered him, okay, so Dr. allowed Brown, him to speak to Dr. Kelly about defendant's statements. All right, but uh, I'm sorry, so, but, but no, did I the prosecutor it. have Dr. Brown's stuff? Not physically, no. Oh, so all he got to do, all the prosecutor got to do was talk to Dr. Kelly about what Dr. Kelly had learned from Dr. Brown's stuff. That's correct. But not that he, but the prosecutor, as I understand it, couldn't get the defendant's statements. That's correct. No, Even no, though he could talk to, to no, Kelly no, about no. Brown, but couldn't get the statements until, until, after, until the after the opening. The opening. Oh, yeah, until after oh, okay. the after. I'm saying is when right. Dr. Brown got on the stand, the prosecutor could say, now, didn't, didn't uh, the defendant here tell you this, 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 and this, and this? Well, and actually, um, the way it, what happened was, Dr. Brown took the stand, and the, the statements that the defendant now complains about were the, that Dr. Brown opened the door on direct examination. By, um, by doing what? By saying that um, on the date of this offense, when all four of these conditions came together, that she M were, Mental conditions? Yeah. The, mental conditions, yes. yeah that um, she uh, suffered from a, she, she had, there was a significant suicide attempt. He said that on direct examination. And then on cross-examination, uh, the prosecutor 
ask details about that. Um, that and it, it um, came out that she had gone to the bedroom with a knife and put it to her neck. And, but after that, she didn't remember anything. She didn't remember stabbing the victim 34 so, so times. So what was unusual, what was turned over in this case that was unusual? Well, it was unusual not to have a report. No, 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 you said that. I understand, I, I, I get that, I get that. New well, ways. it was unusual to have the materials of the defense expert go to the Commonwealth's expert. All these materials. Okay, because, but usu usually because usually a, what but, happens? But usually a report goes and a diagnosis. Yes. Right, okay. It was just that in this case they got more, but you're saying they really got less because they didn't get. They, there still was no they diagnosis. They got papers, but they didn't get what they wanted. Right. There was still no diagnosis. Dr. Kelly, um, there was an affidavit from him in the Commonwealth Appendix dated February 1st, 12 days before trial, that he had perused all of this information and still did not see a report with a diagnosis. And it wasn't until um, the second day of jury impanelment that the Commonwealth heard for the first time that she suffered from these five or four disorders. Okay, and is the rep in ordinary cases, the report and diagnosis that are turned over don't contain statements of the defendant as to the facts of the crime? That right. would be, right, that would be considered to be privileged. Right. Okay. And um, I, th I believe, um, you know, pr privilege, once the defendant puts her um, sanity in play and indicates that she is going to rely at least in part on her statements, then I would think that her statements could be discoverable by the Commonwealth. When is that? You say comes into play. When? Well, it would be after, probably after openings in, in a case like this. Um, there's nothing specific in Rule 14B or anywhere else that says the defendant has to um, supply a report from his or her expert. Is that right? That's right. It's un unlike the federal rule that mandates it. So did, what, right. did uh, Judge uh, Josephson say that the Commonwealth could not get the notes or simply said you're free to give the notes but then the Commonwealth never got them? I mean, why, why was it the Commonwealth didn't get the actual notes but simply had Kelly speak to the prosecutor? Well, because Judge Josephs, the defendant didn't comply with Judge Josephson's discovery order. Um, she appealed to the single justice. Um, justice Spina denied her 211-3 petition the Commonwealth moved to compel discovery, in other words, to compel compliance with Judge Josephson's order. Um, Judge Sweeney allowed that motion to compel. The defendant then took another 211-3 petition, and that's when Justice, and, and then submitted um, a dis, an exemplar to Justice Spina. Um, ex parte or in camera that the Commonwealth didn't have access in to. Of the notes. And that's when he issued his order that everything should be, um, that what just Judge Josephson ordered should be delivered to right, Dr. Right, I understand that. But, but when Judge Josephson, after opening, said she's now committed to an insanity defense. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Judge McDonald who was yeah. the trial McDonald, judge. I'm sorry. Yes. When Judge McDonald said she's now committed to a, to a uh, Insanity defense. Did he say that that the Commonwealth gets the notes, or simply the Commonwealth can't get the notes, but Kelly can tell the prosecutor what the notes contain? The at that point, um, because ju because Justice Spina's order um, only precluded the Commonwealth from getting statements, I suppose prior to that, the Commonwealth could have discussed the testing materials and with him, um, but it was only after the opening when the Commonwealth could have access to her statements f through Dr. Kelly. Right, but I'm trying to figure out why the Commonwealth didn't get the actual notes as opposed to having Kelly tell the prosecutor what the notes contained. Um, was that by court order or was that just because that's the way it played out? I think that's the way it played out. And whether the, the uh, prosecutor in this case got something other than the defendant's statements, I don't remember and it's not clear from the record. What is clear is he still did not know what her diagnosis was. And I would just like to make one other point. Um, transcript volume nine at pages 58 and 59, 
um, where Dr. Kelly explains the basis for his diagnosis that the defendant did not suffer from a mental disease or defect. He talks about reviewing her medical records and he talks about looking at Dr. Brown's testing materials um, which did not indicate any mental disease or defect. He talks about his interview with the defendant and he talks about her writings that were close in time to the crime. Um, so there's nothing in his opinion, either in his written reports or in his testimony, that indicates that he relied upon the defendant's statements in ordering, um, in offering his diagnosis of her. Ms. Montoli, let me just, uh, you know, just uh, as we're thinking through this, um, uh, you know, just looking back at Blaisdell, you, you go to the to the court-appointed psychiatrist, um, and the, the, the what the defendant has to do is be required to submit to the examination uh, as that psychiatrist deems necessary to obtain a sufficient basis to form an opinion. So that says to me, that psychiatrist can ask the defendant whatever the psychiatrist wants to ask the defendant. It's, it's not a comparative. Then you go down, and then it's all under seal. It's all under seal. Uh, and then it is to the extent that the psychiatric report filed with the court contains privileged and non-privileged. Uh, the court may disclose the non-privileged, um, any non-testimonial evidence uh, obtained from the defendant by virtue shall be admissible on behalf. I mean, it's a very careful all the way down, sealing off that testimonial, sealing off that testimonial of the defendant. And then, and then, only if the defendant offers testimony based on his statements, uh, do you begin to get something different. So, um, I mean, it, it seems to me that what happened here, I, I can understand what may have been the triggering event, but really is not consistent with Blaisdell. But again, Blaisdell doesn't talk about the defendant's expert and discovery of his. That's what well, was Well, what I'm saying here. implicit in. in and, well, and the it, Commonwealth well, is saying it we can't, understand it can't that be there the, may be privileged yeah, statements. Yeah, but it can't in be any, any. Well, okay. I mean, it can't be that uh, the, the Commonwealth. And you're saying so no discovery can force the defendant to hand over, um, uh, you know, the defendant's testimonial, you know, testimonial statements. Prior to trial, that's right. That would be our position. Um, and then once the door is opened at trial, then the d Commonwealth could discover uh, the testimonial st statements upon which the expert relied. As long, but the, the and there's a difference too between what the Commonwealth has access to and what can come into evidence. And it's clear from the statutes that and cases, um, case law that the 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 d defendant's admissions or confessions cannot be used by their expert, even in expert testimony, but, but that's not what happened here. And I think the reports in this case are a good example of what could be provided because neither report contains the defendant's statements in ultimately. And you say the um, defendant's statements won't have to be turned over until it's clear they're going to rely on it at trial. Well, if the defense attorney doesn't make an opening until after the Commonwealth rests, then that could be uh, immediately that's the way it is. Proceeding um, when the defense expert testifies. Well, there, there might have to be some discussion then. Um, but that's the way, it, I mean, that's the way trials have been conducted for hundreds of years. Right. We've just made them more complicated with discovery and everything else. And well, I, I don't think it's trial by ambush. I think it's the way trials were conducted. Not getting these complicated diagnoses before cross examination really was No, I understand the diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ms. Montoya. Thank you very much. All right.